Thank you so much, John. And uh, many thanks to the Graduate School for uh, Social Research and the Polish Academy of Sciences uh, for this invitation. And I'm really happy uh, that we will put disability studies uh, in the spotlight today as this field of study and research um, has proven to be impactful source of rigorous knowledge making that informs discourses and practices on various technologies of social change. And uh, disability studies has been timely and meaningful, and it will continue to be so, uh, given all the unfolding political, economic, cultural challenges uh, such as human rights backlashes or the tightening grip of capitalism. And while disability and disability discrimination have been at the core of the dominant ideologies and state practices, the epistemic problem has been that these phenomena have often been misunderstood or overlooked or downplayed also in academic circles. Such epistemic practices, uh, furthermore, get encapsulated in policies, laws, and dominant discourses. And because of that, they are not neutral, but they have very concrete and tangible consequences, not only for the quality of lives of disabled people, but their lives per se. So, our responsibility as social scientists, uh, to paraphrase disability studies professor Rosemary Gallant Thompson, is to start noticing that disability is everywhere. And once we start noticing that, we should do something about it with our uh, scholarly tools. Uh, while disability studies um, has relatively short history, uh, it has proven to be a potent portal of knowledge and meaning making, uh, which is of relevance uh, to the world's largest minority. And I'm talking, of course, about disabled people. But not only to this group, uh, the impact, impact goes beyond this group. That is, uh, it has impact for the societies at large. Uh, because as experience and history shows, the better the situation of minorities and marginalized groups, the stronger democracy. Okay, so what is disability studies then? Uh, well, as of today, it is many things uh, because it is a vibrant and constantly evolving discipline. But there are key aspects uh, which make disability studies, disability studies. And those aspects differentiate it from other approaches or fields of research and theorizing of disability. So to provide uh, you with an, a natural overview uh, of disability studies, I will talk about what I call the ethos of disability studies and also discuss some of disability studies main methodological and theoretical pillars. So th those issues I hope will be the main takeaways for you today. An important uh, caveat is that given how and where disability studies was initially, initially developed, um, I will focus uh, today primarily on the Anglo-American tradition. Uh, this canon, um, and please keep in mind uh, that this canon is currently being revisited, challenged and expanded uh, also in regards to making it re relevant and meaningful um, for other uh, than Anglo-American contexts on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, in order to enrich the existing canon with other non-Anglo-American socio-political contexts. So to signal those developments, um, I will also provide you with suggestions uh, which academic initiatives are worth your attention if you want to become involved in disability studies uh, or if you are interested, for instance, uh, in engaging in the emerging post-socialist disability studies field. <clears throat> 
So now moving to uh, the nuts and bolts of disability studies. As an academic uh, field, uh, it emerged in the late 1980s in the UK and in the US. And its uniqueness um, stems largely from, as Professor Corker stresses, and I quote, its close connection between scholarship and activism. So the ethos of disability studies uh, is basically based on the type of accountability to disabled people's movement. Therefore, the maxim, uh, the maxim or the main motto of this movement, uh, that is nothing about us without us, is one of the most important signs or guidelines to follow uh, by the researchers who locate themselves uh, within disability studies. Uh, and this ethos requires uh, the involvement of disabled people uh, in the process of academic knowledge making. So theorizing about disability must highlight and foreground disabled people's uh, lived experiences, perspectives, uh, their intellectual contributions and insights. And this very aspect of disability studies uh, has been, uh, in my view, most aptly, aptly expressed by um, an American professor of disability studies, uh, Paul Longmore. Um, sometimes he's called the uh, founding, one of the founding fathers of this discipline who labeled disability studies, um, and I quote, an academic counterpart of the disabled people's movement. When it comes to uh, the group that disability studies primarily focuses on, it is uh, disabled people, but also more broadly, other people with lived experience of disability for instance, parents of disabled children or carers of disabled adults, etc. Uh, and the focus is on those groups, but the, the main aim is to challenge the traditional individualizing and medicalizing positivist scholarly approaches. So disability studies, aims to, first of all, identify and then critique the social, cultural, political, and economic practices and discourses, which historically and currently generate, but also sustain um, st stigmatization, as well as oppression uh, of disabled people and people with lived experience of disability in all spheres of life. And importantly, uh, those various debates and inquiries, um, in order to be uh, in alignment with disability studies ethos, they need to be both academically valid and serve the interest of disabled people. Uh, or as Professor Colin Barnes puts it, uh, and I quote, they should have meaningful and practical outcomes uh, for disabled people. So disability studies research and its methodology, uh, as professors Barnes and Mertz, uh, Mertzer stress, and I quote, they must be politically committed, but rigorous. And now let's move to the methodology uh, of disability studies. So this trope of engaged social research, politically committed but rigorous, might ring a familiar bell to you. And this might be because disability studies is grounded in the critical research tradition, uh, which should be about changing the world. So that orientation uh, the critical research tradition orientation strongly underpins disability studies methodology and informs uh, 
disability studies scholars choices when it comes to methodology and then different research methods. And uh, importantly, the political and transformative aims of the critical uh, research tradition are to be guided by the so-called purpose of emancipation. Uh, what does it mean? Well, this means uh, that researchers are to apply their skills er and knowledge to examining problems and perspectives of oppressed groups in order to contribute to advancing the interests of those groups. And um, as, um, as I already mentioned, such research should become the basis for the academic knowledge claims, but also politically oriented assertions that are meaningful for the group under study. And in the case of disability studies, again, it is mostly disabled people. So a disability studies researcher um, you know, unlike in the traditional positivist research approach, uh, it's not to distance and detach um, themselves from the research subjects, but rather be accountable to them, all the while being able to provide a rigorous analysis of social problems. How about the theoretical underpinnings of disability studies? Uh, disability studies has a strong commitment uh, when it comes to theoretical underpinnings to the social conceptualization of disability, uh, as well as it has a very strong imperative to challenge the so-called, as Professor Mitchell and Snyder call it, the so-called medicalized model of disability. So in other words, um, on this theoretical level, uh, the emergence of disability studies, uh, historically speaking, was, was, was driven by a, a, a very strong paradigm shift uh, from thinking about disability in medical terms to understanding disability as socially generated. And the social model of disability remains the key point of reference for disability studies scholar. And it is, you know, regardless of their chosen intellectual orientation or their disciplinary location, if they are located in humanities or rather sociology, doesn't matter. Social model uh, is generally perceived as the main point of reference for them. Uh, but what is the social model and how it came about? Uh, basically, it was uh, developed uh, by British scholars and um, Professor Mike Oliver was one of the most prominent uh, scholars among them and most influential. And on the basis of um, the definition of disability formulated in the 1970s by a disabled people's organization called the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation, called in short UPS, uh, those British scholars, including Oliver, uh, came up with this, with this idea of the social model. And in a nutshell, the social model challenged um, the dominant medical and individual understandings or models of disability. So uh, I will now discuss those two understandings of disability that is medical and individual, and then uh, talk more about the social model. Uh, and I do it uh, in, in such a way in order for you to understand how, how a groundbreaking of a shift um, in thinking about disability the social model was. Uh, there we go. You can see the next slide. So um, when it comes to medical and individual models of disability, uh, as disability scholars evidence, um, ideologies dominant at a particular time and location have tended to underpin also the dominant understandings of disability. 
which I already mentioned, those understandings shape the laws, policies, and mainstream discourses. So in turn, la largely determine uh, disabled people's lives. And disability studies scholars argue uh, that the 20th century approaches towards disability in the, especially Western countries, have been impacted by socioeconomic forces uh, of industrial capitalism, as well as, and it is important to, to remember that, as well as modernist worldviews, uh, such as scientifically legitimized notion of normalcy. And under such influences, uh, the medical and individual perspectives uh, were established as dominant models of disability. And those frame, framings of disability uh, foreground and validate, and this is also very important to remember, they uh, foreground and validate the medical and biomedical approach towards embodied difference while ignoring the wider context and politics uh, which informs them. So specifically under the medical and individual models, uh, it can be said that disability equals impairments and not systemic discrimination. And by means of the medical discourse, uh, persons with impairments or with disabilities are singled out as so-called abnormal or deviant. And because of that, they have been relegated to medical regime, to, the, to medical institutions, and they have been subjected uh, to the regimes and their power. Uh, and the individual and medical models of disability are often used uh, in disability studies scholarship interchangeably due to their interconnectedness, also in terms of the, their historical um, impact. Uh, and they locate disability, as I said, solely in a biological condition of a person's body or and a person's, uh, person's mind. And as consequence uh, of those, you know, conceptualizations, uh, disabled people, in addition to being targeted by medical discourses, they also became increasingly at risk of um, various types of discrimination and marginalization. Uh, for instance, you know, impoverishment, social exclusion. Uh, but also spatial and institutional segregation. And um, often the best they could hope for in their lives was a kind of charity uh, from, for instance, philanthropic um, organizations. And under such circumstances, uh, disability grew to be widely associated uh, with many undesirable social features and undesirable cultural notions, such as um, you know being defective, dependent, inferior, passive, or pitiable, and um, a personal so-called tragedy perspective on disability has been uh, sustained and solidified through mainstream cultural representations and uh, very often um, legitimized also by charity organizations. So the individual and medical models of disability um, have been found by disability studies scholar to permeate contemporary uh, neoliberal uh, structures and cultural landscapes. And why the canonical Anglo-American uh, disability scholarship has tended to associate these models uh, primarily uh, with the capitalist Western societies, the um, post-socialist disability researchers uh, come up with evidence uh, that similar models 
have also been characteristic for state socialist country of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Uh, so now I talked a little bit about the, uh, the individual medical model of disability, and now I'll be moving on to the social model of disability. Uh, and so those two models I already described, they have been challenged and we can say radically challenged, not by academics, uh, uh, but by disabled activists themselves. And it happened in the second part of the 20th century. Uh, so those uh, intellectual and acti activist developments, they took uh, shape in the times of growing social um, movements and ideas of emancipation uh, that led different minority groups, um, not only disabled people, to identify and politicize um, the workings of oppression uh, uh, that have faced, that they have faced uh, in, com in contemporary societies. And they already mentioned by me um, the Union of Phys uh, the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, the UPS. Uh, well, it's considered one of the most um, influ influential disability disabled people's organization in the history of the British disabled people's movement. And it is also, and this is an important um, fact to uh, remember, it is they are they have been also. Uh, and they are also considered a forerunner of disability studies as an academic discipline. Uh, UPS was created uh, around 1972 um, as a, let's say, non-governmental organization, but its main premise, which at that time was very uh, innovative and groundbreaking was that it would be run as well as controlled, not by non-disabled people as it was usually the case, uh, but by non-disabled people. Uh, and I hope you can see the next slide. And the specifics of uh, UPS intellectual contributions, or as Professor Shakespeare um, calls it, and I quote, political ideology of disability um, and the inter interrelated new definition, new understanding uh, of disability were under um, outlined in the famous document, which is called the Fundamental Principles of Disability, which was uh, published in 1976. And this definition uh, was to become labeled later on by Professor Oliver as the already mentioned social model of disability. Uh, the revolutionary shift and the paradigm shift that I already mentioned in thinking about disability was that uh, UPS leaders um, challenged, wanted to challenge the very foundation on which the hegemonic models of uh, you know, the individual and medical model of disability rested. Uh, so UPS thoroughly under, undermined the causal link between impairment and disability. And they clearly draw boundaries between those two notions. So they defined uh, impairment as, and I quote, and you can also see it on the slide, as lacking all or part of a limb or having defective limb organism or mechanism of the body, while they understood disability on the other hand, and I quote, as the disadvantage or restriction of activity caused by contemporary social organization. So between uh, these two understandings definition, disability became wholly social phenomena. And the essence of this uh, radical shift in thinking about disability uh, is encapsulated um, in the following passage, and you also have it on the slide. I, I quote, um, in our view, it is society which disables 
physically impaired people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. Disabled people are therefore an oppressed group in society." End of quote. So building on the definition of disability, uh, UPS drew a parallel between disabled people and other minorities which um, have been segregated and oppressed uh, by society. And disabled people um, in consequence were framed by UPS as a minority group subjected to, uh, uh, to societal oppression. And that was absolutely, a, let's say, an intellectual game changer at that time. And though the detailed meaning ascribed to the notion of oppression, uh, as you can see, is just alluded to uh, by UPS rather than explained in detail, um, tackling it constitute, uh, constituted the organizing principle uh, for the many important uh, collective political actions that were envisioned as well as, well as undertaken by UPS. Uh, so as you can see, this organization was not only run by disabled people, but it was also guided by a political principle of redirecting the focus from people with impairments onto the wider disabling systems um, of oppression and segregation. And now we arrive again at Professor Mike's Oliver contribution because it is exactly on this complex intellectual and activist basis that I just explained. Uh, he, Professor Mike Oliver, in 1983 formulated the social model of disability uh, and he formulated it in such a way that it it was a form of um, conceptualization of disability which was to stand in binary opposition um, to the medical and individual conception of disability so they were to form uh, polar opposites social model of disability versus individual and medical model of disability. Uh, and the social model of disability as already mentioned, it became central both for disability studies as a academic and in university discipline, but also for um, disabled people's movement. And Professor Oliver himself um, emphasized uh, that by defining disability as a social construct, uh, he was not introducing um, a new idea per se. So he was not trying to uh, reclaim ownership or claim owner ownership over this idea. Uh, he stressed rather that he arrived at the social model, and I quote, quite simply and explicitly from the distinction originally made between impairment and disability by, by the union of physically impaired against segregation. Uh, and it is also important to uh, keep in mind that Oliver's intention uh, was at that time in the 1980s was not to create a theory of disability, but again, his aim was to translate UPS very nuanced and novel intellectual contribution into a more pragmatic and I would say even tangible term uh, that would be of use uh, for, as Oliver said, professionals uh, with, um, with a limited though expanding knowledge of disability issues, such as social workers. Uh, let me show you the next slide. There it is. So Professor Olivier um, viewed the social model as a type of like a practical, but also scholarly tool, but, but, but not as a theory. Uh, and he uh, described it, and I quote, that the social model um, was involving 
nothing more or less fund uh, involving nothing more or less fundamental than a switch away from focusing on the physical limitations of particular individuals to the way the physical and social environments impose limitations upon certain groups or categories of people, thus excluding them from mainstream uh, social activities." End of quote. And this uh, rigorousness of the division between impairment and disability uh, in Professor Oliver's um, concept of disability, which was necessary to mount a very powerful opposition to medical and individual uh, models of disability. It, it, it enhanced um, the materialistic perspective on the um, disabling conditions faced by people with disabilities. Uh, so this approach uh, and this materialistic perspective earned it a name of a so-called strong social model approach uh, with disability scholars who adhere and they still adhere many of them are still adhere um, to it uh, they became known as the strong social modelists by contesting uh, those hegemonic disability models and uh, their uh, narratives about uh, and representations of disabled people uh, the social model of disability informed disability advocacy and politics um, to successfully tackle some of the structural, so material barriers, um, but also it enabled to bring a stronger sense of unity, uh, in-group solidarity, as well as empower, empowerment and dignity for people with disabilities. And Professor Shakespeare, um, aptly explained that phenomena, and I quote, suddenly people with the means of the social model were able to understand that it was society which was at fault, not themselves. They didn't need to change, society needed to change. They didn't have to be sorry for themselves, rather they could be angry. So disabled people began to think of themselves in a totally new way, and to become empowered, to mobilize for equal citizenship, end of quote. As I mentioned um, already, uh, there are many important academic developments in the dominant um, Anglo-American disability studies uh, field. And those developments uh, take form of challenging, for instance, what Prof Professor Mikosha calls claim of universal universality, which is correct, characteristic uh, for the Anglo-American disability studies. So in effect, for instance, there are uh, stronger calls to include research uh, and perspectives uh, done by scholars hailing from uh, regions outside of the Anglo-American setting. Um, and simultaneously, we are also experiencing the, the emergence of the post socialist uh, disability studies, uh, which uh, focuses on the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, as well as we are uh, witnessing and co-creating a certain uh, development, which I, uh, which I term a disability studies turn in the Polish disability scholarship. And when we look at, at those developments from even a um, a more macro, macro perspective and a more global scale, um, there is a growing critique of the dominance of the global North um, perspectives um, over the global South uh, knowledge making about disability. So uh, going back to, to my earlier question, uh, what is disability studies then? Uh, I would say that altogether we should rather think about it uh, not as a singular field, by, but we should think of it more in plural terms. Uh, that's one thing. And moreover, uh, disability studies, due to its ethos, um, is quite self-reflexive uh, um, and self-critical. And it's 
it's, it's really continuously evolving as a discipline. And because of those factors, as Professor Price right, uh, rightly states, um, it may also be sometimes, and I quote, messy and rather contagious. Um, so that is why it requires conducting constant member checks of our assumptions, practices, and beliefs. Uh, so that the already mentioned disability uh, studies ethos uh, can be upheld. Now, uh, I wanted to, to give you a, a small footnote when it comes to terminology, because you might have noticed and perhaps wondered uh, why I have been using the term disabled people instead, for instance, people with disabilities. Um, and this choice uh, is uh, consistent with the British social model terminology, which is known as the identity first language rather than the person first language. So that is why uh, I speak about disabled people rather than about people with disabilities. However, uh, as Professor Heyer explains, disability terminology, so what do we call ourselves? What do we ask others to call us? Uh, becomes an important political tool to, for instance, reclaim a sense of identity and personhood. Um, that is why, for instance, uh, in my current research on political activism and on contributions to policy making done by um, disabled women in European Union, I preserve the person first language in the English translations from my informer, uh, informants uh, whenever this type of terms are being used by them in their native languages. Now I'd like you to look to take a look at this slide, at this visual, uh, which is uh, called uh, inaccessibility cycle. And take a moment to think about what I said about disability studies, what is disability studies, and try to think whether this um, graphic uh, visually uh, sums up what you think and how you understood disability studies is about. And I would say, and I would argue that partially, it is a very good illustration of what disability studies aims to do. But what is missing in this inaccessibility cycle um, is the um, disability understood as a tool for innovative social change or for um, knowledge making. Uh, but also um, a lot of people uh, from, from, from my community, as yes, I'm also a, a disabled one, uh, for, for, for many of my peers, disability is a part of their identity and also a source of pride. So those aspects and those multi-layered nuances are not captured by, by this inaccessibility cycle. And of course, one visual cannot capture uh, such a multi-layered uh, field. Uh, that is why um, if you got interested in disability studies by what you've heard about it today, um, I would I would, I, would, uh, rec I would be willing to recommend you uh, various networks or uh, disability studies initiatives that you could um, easily get engaged in and learn more about this multifaceted uh, field. Thank you for your attention and I'm open for any questions that you might have.